educational exchanges office of uh, state department and from world learning whom we thank for their support today together with um, with my colleague um, diana philemon we will uh, moderate a very important session and i would like to thank all of you for being part of this session my name is uh, nicolas panagioto don't expect to remember my surname or to pronounce it well I even have sometimes hard times to pronounce it. Um, I am associate professor at School of Journalism and Mass Media Communications, at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and also head of Decent Global and Diana. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a president of Forum Apulum and Civic NGO in Romania, and also member of the DCN board, and very happy to be here with you. And also Aura, please. Hello, everyone. My name is um, Aura Kawanzaroa, and I am Managing Director of Africa Digital and also Head of DCN Africa. Thank you all. Uh, as you can see in DCN, uh, we, we place a lot of emphasis in uh, gender balancing and actually gender, gender overcoming us. This is, can be actually seen that from... Uh, the number of uh, female speakers that uh, constitute our panel today. And I would like to start presenting them uh, from, uh, from uh, I will start from uh, Chrisa Lazo. Chrisa um, Lazo is uh, a teacher of the secondary education and also initiator of uh, many initiatives regarding uh, media literacy in Greece. Serik Hope Calver, it is, he is associate professor at Temple University in the United States and also a part of the member of the board of UNESCO Mill Alliance. Irini Andreopoulou, she is also from Greece. She is part of UNESCO Mill Alliance board and also in, uh, she is in charge of ECOMEA, which is an audiovisual organization in Greece regarding uh, relevant issues. Then we have Associate Professor Roberto Gelado from University of Madrid that he is working and specializes in media uh, in media literacy and also disinformation. Also, we have um, Aaron Melikan, which he is um, uh, an expert also in uh, media literacy from Armenia. And uh, we have also Professor Drisia Suid that she is also Associate Professor from uh, University of Morocco, whom we also, and also member of the UNESCO Mill Alliance. We would like to thank you all for being with us and uh, being part of, uh, of actually this event that it is part of UNESCO uh, Media Literacy Week. Um, Digital Communication ne Network wants actually to celebrate this week and emphasize on the importance of Mill as a way to, to actually promote critical thinking, awareness, and also promote civic education. Uh, I would like to, to start from uh, Hrisa Lazu. Uh, Hrisa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Panagiotou, for the invitation, first of all. And uh, I'm really glad to be part of this uh, global panel and the great event. So I would like to share and visualize what I have to say. May I share my screen, please? Great, thank you. So uh, as Professor Panagiotou has already mentioned, I'm an educator uh, in the public sector in secondary education, and I implement projects on media literacy and critical thinking skills. So uh, why media literacy? Uh, in education. First and foremost, information and new knowledge uh, does not only derive from brick and mortar education any longer. Uh, as I have conducted a survey with 180 students recently, uh, aged 12 to 15, uh, they answered that uh, they do not uh, wait till their next session with their teachers to find answers to their questions but they just Google and find out what they need. So the first question to ask is how reliable is the information they come across? And uh, we live in a 
in an era of produceage of information. The second question to ask is that, on the other hand, today's youth uh, does not um, communicate uh, publicly uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the political issues are concerned. So they are disengaged and demotivated from uh, having their own opinion and uh, have their own uh, say and word in political discourse, though they will very soon be asked to vote and make decisions for their future. So this brings to light the issue of engagement that it is at very low levels. And at the same time, uh, the media literacy ecosystem that they have to uh, change and we need to uh, renovate in order to have a role as teachers in, uh, uh, in our formal education. We are not uh, the authority. We are not uh, the only source of information. Uh, learners tend to be autonomous. So we need to educate them how to uh, have access and responsible learning. So the overall goal and our new uh, goal setting as teachers is to raise awareness of our students in the educational context, especially in formal education, uh, that we need to uh, take care of disinformation, raise awareness on that and consider uh, what this may mean for the public opinion and avoid negative consequences on um, different spheres of our society. So here I can share uh, the case study of Greece according to Media Literacy Index 2021. Uh, we're very low at the rank. Uh, we are the 27th country out of 35 countries, which means that we have very low resilience to disinformation. So how can we teachers engage our students in media literacy? Uh, first of all, we need to have implementation of projects in our ed own educational context. We need to have training as teachers so, uh, so as to successfully implement and teach our students strategies and critical thinking skills on how to have access to information that is reliable. Uh, all this, of course, could lead to uh, renovation in the school curricula that uh, should be approached interdisciplinary as information in the new era has to approach to many disciplines. So how media literacy in, in schools? First of all, we need to encourage our students to have access to digital and print resources at the same time. Analysis, deconstruction and reconstruction of all messages they come across and apply critical thinking skills. They need to cross check and evaluate the messages that they come across. They need to create purposeful content and interact uh, in the digital era successfully. We can have visits from and to media experts and thus lead to active participation in e-citizenship. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is too much discussion on uh, the use of mobile devices and uh, <laughs> teenagers' ownership of mobile devices and new technologies. Well, uh, according to NAMLA conference this year, uh, we need to remove guilt of the use of mobile devices because uh, uh, all of us have to have access to information. And this is also a right and a must uh, in the new era. The problem is that what we need to do is to encourage our students to critically think how they have to use, to make proper use of their devices. So to enjoy what it has to offer and avoid potential risks. Uh, I would like to share with you some of the initiatives I have taken and coordinated so far. Uh, Professor Panayotu has been a valuable partner in most of them. So the first project that I started uh, implementing in Greece was in 2018, after my invitation by Word Learning uh, to uh, participate with uh, 43 educators from uh, Europe and Eurasia in a seminar in Kyiv. So when I came back to Greece, this was the first uh, project. It was the Media Literacy for Teens project that we interacted with other schools. And we had the opportunity to uh, give our students support with authentic materials in class, visits uh, from experts and two places that media uh, is produced. So we tried to implement the project uh, leveraging all four uh, skills essential for the 24th century. So we needed to have students collaborate with each other. 
uh, create, communicate, and apply critical thinking skills. Uh, while we turned to the shift to ERT, to emergency remote teaching, uh, we turned the crisis to an opportunity. So the next project I implemented was the digiteens.gr project that we uh, taught students how to uh, use uh, LMS platforms, online learning, how to learn to learn online, and at the same time, how to access digital resources while they were at home. And home-based learning is much different from uh, the, 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 the class, the physical place that they are used to learn. At the same time, the uh, digital resources should have been critically uh, approached and accessed. So this was another opportunity to implement media literacy uh, projects. Students uh, created concept maps on the types of misleading information. They uh, rose awareness of how media formats or uh, language can evoke different emotions, uh, how to distinguish fact from opinion or bias in the media. Next project implemented was the Verify Info Ed, which was training courses for teachers. Uh, the training sessions were implemented for both pre-service and in-service teachers, which was a very uh, great initiative as we had the opportunity to have the fresh ideas of the pre-service teachers that interacted with uh, in-service teachers with long experience in education. So they collaborated in pairs and they created classroom materials in a very interactive, uh, friendly, and at the same time, professional manner. Last year, we ran uh, the Greek Media Literacy Week with Professor Panayotou for uh, teenagers and teachers. And uh, we called, we invited teachers from different regions from Greece. So uh, they were representatives from school units and they enjoyed sessions in groups that they interacted sharing their experiences while uh, in the pandemic, uh, how they experienced media while home-based and spending long hours uh, without their friends. Uh, crossing the borders, uh, other projects that we have implemented on a transnational level are training sessions in the Balkans regions as Balkan, uh, Balkans unfortunately are very low to the rate of the Media Literacy Index 2021. So we were invited to interact with our colleagues, uh, English language colleagues from the Balkans region and especially from Romania. And we had training sessions for the teachers there. And uh, at the moment, I am implementing the communitized project that we have 75 students from three different countries, Greece, Romania, and Bulgaria. Uh, our ultimate goal is to enhance our media literacy skills for our students and their intercultural understanding for the social good. The students are thrilled. Actually, yesterday we had our first live uh, session, <laughs> synchronous session, and we have implemented pro the project through augmented reality materials, uh, gamification, and we are uh, close to filmmaking now. Thank you so much. Uh, I would just like to close my presentation by sharing with you that as Ryan quotes, everyone has the right to participate in what the world has to offer and reap the benefits of this involvement. So the new digital era has so much to offer. We need to critically resist to potential risks and reap the benefits of our purposeful participation and involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa, Diana. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to, to hear and see more details about what the work you're doing it's uh, it's very valuable and uh, definitely i'm looking forward to see the impact because it's it's a time where we need it the most and it's my turn to to introduce the next uh, our next speaker sherry hope 
Culver is a director of the Center for Media and Information Literacy at Temple University and in the United States. And she is uh, where she's an associate professor in the Klein College of Media and Communication. She is teaching and uh, she's very focused in teaching on media literacy. And of course, she she has done it in a very in a very cool way, which is also always needed when you're doing media literacy, especially for the younger generation, in order to communicate uh, the, the idea. She's vice chair of the Global Media and Information uh, Literacy Alliance, a UNESCO-led alliance of over 600 organizations from 80 countries. And she also makes a very cool podcast called uh, Kids Talk Media. So uh, as, I, as, as you can see, she's a great speaker and I'm looking forward to, to her input. Cheryl, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. And hi, everyone. It's it's wonderful to see some some friends, folks I already know, and and uh, new faces as well. So that's that's lovely. And I also feel like this is um, one of the wonderful things about getting us all together. And here we often don't have the time to hear about everyone's work, so it's nice to be able to share this. So I am going to share my screen because I feel that PowerPoints keep me on track. You might think that we do them for the people watching, but I think it's actually better for me. So I know all of you are all over the world here. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the center that I direct at Temple does and my efforts at Temple, and then tell you about some other things that are happening in the United States. Um, keep, my, keep track of time here. And, and a few global things as well that, I, that I'm involved in. So at Temple University, I'm, um, as Diana mentioned, I'm on the faculty there. I'm in the Department of Media Studies and Production. I worked in the media industry for 25 years or so uh, before I came to academia as a producer and an executive producer. And then I, I ran a television station for a while. So my teaching often centers on the media business. So I'm really interested in the responsibility of media industries to the audiences, particularly to children. I'm very interested in that. And the Center for Media and Information Literacy does uh, local, very hyper-local in Philadelphia, regional and international projects relating to MIL. The one that, that you can see right there, the role of play in building media literacy, that was an event from last night that was a collaboration with the Children's Media Association, the National Association for Media Literacy Education in the US, and LEGO, right, the little building blocks. And we were talking about how you use critical thinking and Lego when you're building and how that can develop media literacy skills and those can be applied in children's media. So one of the projects of the CMIL, what I'll call the CMIL, the center, is Media Inside Out. I've been doing this series since 2012. We have about, I think I'm on episode 55 or 56. So it's basically a monthly series where I interview people about some aspect of media literacy. I think, um, so it, it airs on the university's television station and it's streamed as well. So it's accessible, it should be accessible to everyone. And it really just gives me an opportunity to help people see the breadth of what is MIL, right? And not just to think of it in one particular way. These are some of the uh, folks that I have been working with over the, the past year or so. So the, the I guess I, I, I mean, as Diane mentioned, I'm very passionate about media and information literacy, and I, I feel very strongly about people getting experience with it at the youngest age possible. So the work I did with the Public Journalism Club, which is in Armenia, was in with preschool teachers and talking with preschool teachers and training them. We did a series of webinars, and then I actually went to Armenia, which was my first like international outside of US trip after the pandemic. Um, the Street Project Foundation is in um, Africa, in, I believe she's in Nigeria. And that's a project that we did virtual training with um, high school students and some college students around media literacy. The Digital Communications Network that's presenting this today, I've done a series of trainings with preschool teachers and with other teachers as well and, and practitioners and journalists. So different um, ways of helping people think about the way they can integrate MIL into their work. The Philadelphia Inquirer is the major newspaper in Philadelphia. It's really it's won many national and international awards. 
And it, you know, obviously it's not just a paper anymore, it's online, but they have embarked on a project that is around digital equity, I'm sorry, diversity, equity, and inclusion, a DEI project that is about how they write the content and how they can make sure to be, um, be mindful about the words that they use and the approaches they take to be more diversity-minded to the community. Um, this really came to a head when the Black Lives Matter movement really grew. And uh, it's been very interesting to work with reporters in, in and re-examining and reflecting on their own choices in their, their writing. And Thesum, of course, which is the, um, the annual um, program in Greece that many of you are, are involved with. I also teach a course at the university that's a media literacy course called Media in a Hypermediated World. And I'm happy to share any information with any of you that are in higher ed, share a syllabus or whatever you might need. Um, it's always good to share ideas. This is a course that took several years for me to convince folks at the university that we needed. And after the election in the US for president in 2016, um, that was the turning point where the proliferation of fake news and discussions about fake news finally allowed us to move forward, but it took another three years till it happened. And so I've been teaching it since 2019. We also manage the, the Center for Media and Information Literacy manages an organization in Philadelphia called the Philly Youth Media Collaborative, which is a, um, a group of organizations, you can see all those logos below, that, that work with youth in media, right? And they, they very often do not think about media literacy. And so we've been trying to help them see the difference between just having production after school production programs and making films and those sorts of things and how they can shift that to include media literacy training as well. And so they can thread media literacy um, competencies into their work. The, the center is also a member of UNESCO's Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue University Network. Uh, many of you know that one involvement with UNESCO means lots of acronyms and I don't wanna bog us down with the uh, confusing acronyms. I'm happy to share more details um, offline or, or um, in other ways. So the, the university collaborative started in 2012 and it is really, it started with just eight universities of which Temple University was one. It's now grown to about 26 universities and they are specifically the research side of the MIL work that happens through UNESCO. Diana mentioned I do a podcast called Kids Talk Media, so you should be able to access that. I, it had to stop for a little while during the pandemic and hopefully we'll come back because it's in, an interview program uh, where I talk to two best friends about their media use. So I feel strongly about when, when I, because I do a lot of work that involves Media literacy for children, I want to talk to kids and not just make assumptions about that. And so Kids Talk Media gives us an opportunity to do that. In the US, the leading uh, media literacy organization though is the National Association for Media Literacy Education, NAMELY is the acronym. Um, it was just mentioned earlier about the conference. And so NAMELY is a free organization. It's something that all of you could and I would hope would actually join. Um, I was the president of Namely for a number of years, but I, I am not any longer, but I do projects with Namely. I wanted to tell you about a couple of those projects that, that I'm not involved in all of these, but to just give you a sense of what Namely does. One thing that they, they started that I thought might be of interest to everyone here is their National Media Literacy Alliance. So they were recognizing that there were many organizations in the US that were talking about doing work in MIL, but they weren't talking to each other. So Namely brought them all together and now they are sharing, they're sharing data, they're sharing information, they do projects together. It's really been, um, it's, it's shifted the way media literacy is talked about in the United States. I know that I'm gonna just go quickly through some of these slides because we don't have much time and I, have, I know there's so many other folks to speak. Most of these items would be accessible to you on the Namely website. So there was a snapshot that we did um, a report that I wrote in 2019 that interviewed and surveyed many people who do media literacy in the US and did a report on that and sort of looking at what 
kind of practices were happening in the US. But the most timely element is this, this mapping impactful practices in media literacy. This is actually a report that's going to be unveiled tonight as part of Media Information Literacy Week. So you can go to Mapping Impactful Media Literacy, media literacy Practices online and the report will be released. I don't think it's gonna be released until, until tonight, but they interviewed um, 3,000 people across the, surveyed and, and interviewed 3,000 people across the US looking for best practice and specifically around social justice issues. So media literacy and social justice. That particular project actually was a global research project. One piece of it was Australia focused and one piece of it was US focused. In Australia, that resulted in this media literacy in Australia a qualitative study. And that is also available for free that you can download online. Australia is really at the earlier stages of pulling a lot of their um, MIO work together, but they're available to talk about all of that. And then also in the United States is the International Council for Media Literacy, which was formerly called the Telemedia Council, a newer organization that is thinking about um, their uh, same idea about media literacy work. And they're just at the early stages of sort of figuring out what their focus is going to be, but they will um, have a more international focus. The UNESCO MIL Alliance, of which I'm, I'm serving currently as the vice chair, is again, an, an opportunity for all of us to come together um, to share information. There are many resources, educational curriculum that are available. So there are things that can be downloaded. The, the goal of the MIL Alliance is really networking, networking and seeding collaboration. So looking for opportunities where people can talk with each other, share information, be motivated and inspired by the other work that they see. And you, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reports and information available to you for free on the UNESCO website. So I'm going to skip, I have a lot of information here about specifics that are happening in the United States and programs that are happening. I'm happy to share information with anyone about more of these projects. Um, there's lots of, um, lots of different activities um, and lots of different television programs. I wanted to also note that the social media companies are starting to put some funding toward this. We, the research project I mentioned with Namely was actually funded by Facebook. So they had formally stated that they would not, um, that they would not be involved in, they would not direct any of the research. So they provided funds, but they had nothing to do with the research at all. And that was, and they really held to that. So I it was a very positive experience and we're hopeful that they'll fund future research as well, which I think they should. So I'm gonna stop there. There's my contact information. Um, I'm happy to, to speak with folks and, and uh, share more information. Thank you all. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you very much. Aura? Thank you, Sherry. I found that really interesting. Also, never crossed my mind that you can do media literacy with like preschoolers. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and I think it's amazing work that you're doing. Coming up, um, oh, before I forget, uh, there is one more speaker. Um, for those of you who maybe have joined us, who didn't uh, get introduced in the beginning, Farai Makutuya from Zimbabwe in Uganda, and he's an international journalist, and he's part of our panel of speakers today. Thank but you. Coming up, sure. Coming up next, we have uh, Roberto Gelado. I, I'm so sure I didn't say your surname correctly. So please correct me, Roberto. Um, and he's a professor at uh, the San pa Sao Pablo University in uh, Spain. Yes, thank you. I've, I've been called worse things than your pronunciation that was perfect. So uh, thanks for introducing me. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as uh, Ara and, and Nico said before, I'm a lecturer and a researcher here at the Universidad de San Pablo in Madrid, in Spain. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot from, from your uh, intakes. Uh, I, I knew some of you, I knew Sherry, and, and, and it's always a pleasure to hear all of you and to gather ideas because uh, I'm leading, I'm a principal investigator of a, of a research group here at SEU that started uh, working on this information, as uh, Nico said before. Um, we were uh, granted some funding by um, Facebook 
and the uh, um, foundation here in Spain to preserve the values of uh, journalism. And we ran it as a project to try and spot uh, where was this information um, having a more active focus. So our, our initial approach to this issue was to try and trace the profiles of uh, vulnerability to target the media literacy actions on those people. Um, and some of them were spotted in, in the presentations uh, before. And we expected them, um, especially notably the adolescents were uh, typically target uh, the, the, the consume a lot of this information and, and not always had um, the filters to process it um, adequately or to defend themselves from uh, disinforming messages. But we also found that there were other profiles like um, um, unemployed people and, and especially people who consume the internet uh, for more than three hours a day. They were particularly uh, prone, vulnerable to this information. I have to say that um, the project I'm I'm just summarizing it for the for the time pressure, but um, it was a it was a, a long project. We run um, focus groups and um, and around uh, four thousand five hundred um, 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 interviews to respondents that we were presenting an experiment with. Uh, so we we detected several traits of this information um, related to the channel, related to the format, related to the type of news and the stories. And we exposed them to, to uh, fake news to try also not only to um, spot the, the profiles of vulnerability on the receivers, but also the profiles of what makes stories more uh, believable uh, for, for, those, um, for those users. And what we found was that, yes, there were a niche of people who um, were more prone to believe disinforming stories. But it's the, the, the main conclusion of our um, study, this was run in 2019 before the world came to an end with, with COVID. So the results were really interesting because they were not um, mediated by everything that was accentuated with COVID. Um, the results show that, um, that half or more than half actually, it was a little bit more than half of the Spanish population that we, um, that we researched uh, presented a significant uh, degree of vulnerability towards this information. And this was surprising for us because in running our media literacy actions, we believe that uh, we were targeting more specific audiences when in reality, this, is a, uh, this proved to be a, a more um, widespread problem. It's a generalized problem that probably needs to be tackled from um, early stages as Aura uh, said before, and as Sherry was pointing out with those actions to preschoolers, which uh, by no means seem as an exaggeration to me, um, because uh, it, it, it's um, uh, the more we research this information, we felt that um, we're trying to make up for some wrongs that happened before, but we can also operate the, the opposite way. We can try and prevent um, these this, uh, problems uh, that are affecting society from very early stages is by giving um, users and especially future consumers of uh, media or current consumers because uh, they start really early um, with the tools to face those contents with a with a critical um, with a critical eye. So um, the amongst the the I mean. Coming up with this uh, general uh, conclusion, we did actually uh, spotted specific targets that could be, um, um, it, it would be really nice to um, um, promote media literacy actions to work, like, um, as we said, the youth and also the elderly were um, people who uh, would benefit from media um, literacy in, uh, literacy uh, actions. We also spotted that the um, um, economic situation was uh, was a factor uh, towards the impact of this information. Um, not extremely significant, but a more favorable economic position usually decreased the potential uh, vulnerability to um, this information. We expected to find also a um, bigger factor in the educational level, uh, but we found out that it was not such a determining factor. It was true that slightly uh, lower educational level levels show a slightly higher degree of vulnerability towards this information, but it wasn't um, extremely significant, significant or not as significant as uh, we expected. What we also found, um, especially at the focus group stage of our research, was that um, um, the, um, the very old um, um, cognitive dissonance process, uh, the, um, the confirmation bias that's been uh, updated lately, uh, was also proved here that this information and the messages, uh, the disinforming messages were, um, were more likely to be believed if they confirmed the previous beliefs of the, of the consumers, of the users, uh, which also takes us back to the initial point. 
um, the the disinformation, the information disorders are affecting specific groups of people, and some of them are particularly key to try and um, uh, to lessen the effect of disinformation. But it is not a so much targeted um, um, phenomenon. It's 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 widespread because everyone can be uh, believe in information that's um, that's distorted simply because we have this confirmation um, this confirmation bias. So basically, at the end of our um, project, um, we uh, propose different actions. Uh, some of them, including the media literacy. Um, the media literacy um, way of uh, facing this problem, but others um, aiming at something that has become quite uh, up to date lately, especially with some scandals involving the um, social networks. Like uh, we propose mes measures uh, aimed at guaranteeing uh, a bigger transparency of the online digital um, ecosystem, like uh, the, something that could be implemented, for instance, by promoting the uh, express identification of whoever is behind the sender of information, uh, which is not always easy and, and, and not even with media literacy actions. We um, praise for an exhaustive identification of whatever content that was sponsored, um, which is also uh, difficult to find sometimes and um, we uh, promoted the designing of uh, efficient mechanisms of cooperation um, between the different actors. So we've talked here and I liked how the profiles came from the media world and also from the academia and the, and the big tech. I think this is a problem that affects society as a whole and there's many actors involved and need to play um, in, the same, in the same direction. Also, it, within this uh, bigger responsibility on the part of the technological uh, players, we um, we asked for a bigger involvement in um, promoting scholarships to help researchers um, uh, that specialize in the field of disinformation to work um, on on finding out more on how this information uh, works and operates because uh, we started this uh, two years ago and a lot of new uh, formats and and ways of um, sending information um, disorders uh, have appeared since then, so we need to update um, the, the knowledge of the phenomenon to be able to fight it with media literacy um, actions. And we praise the fact that we were able to conduct that research on the basis of the funding that we received by private institutions, but uh, more than just the occasional um, occasional um, um, grants and, and, and funds, uh, we wanted to, to see something that was more uh, systematic and, and that sadly uh, is, is far from being a reality, but it would, uh, definitely, um, it would definitely improve the situation. And the third uh, axis of action was um, um, basically that. It was um, media literacy, action aimed at favoring the, the critical spirit of uh, citizenship. And here we um, he actually mentioned, I mean, we weren't very original, but we mentioned the, the five laws of uh, UNESCO's media and information um, literacy because um, uh, we, we were not going to invent what was already um, established. And we tried to, um, to inform what targets could be specially uh, vulnerable with our research. So um, uh, the, the, the media literacy actions proposed by, by UNESCO uh, could be um, used on them. Um, after that, um, and more recently, I was um, well. We we obtained funding from funding from uh, DCN and and um, um, the training that we uh, did on this information in in the summer to run a joint project uh, for university students um, because um, even though we we hadn't spotted them as a specific uh, targets that were vulnerable to this information in our research. Um, we found that from our experience as um, university lecturers, in, and especially in the field of um, communication, uh, people take for granted that um, university students in the field of communication, because they study communication, they are not uh, the target of this information, but our experience tells uh, otherwise. I mean, uh, the, we, we can hear our students uh, during the break sharing content that um, is not always um, not distorted. So we thought that it, it could uh, media literacy actions uh, could have a double 
function and, and better um, we can make the most of, of um, targeting this specific audience because they are going to be the ones that professionally will influence other people in the future and we shouldn't take for granted that they already know how to discern what um, information or what contents may be biased or uh, maybe distorted or not and we have presented a project that we uh, hope to run uh, between the uh, University of Pristina and um, here, um, the University of San Pablo in Madrid uh, during um, this year. And we'll probably, I mean, definitely learn from the previous experiences that have been mentioned here and, and others. Also, I'm part of, the, of one of the uh, eight hubs that were um, launched in the, in the first wave by the European Commission. Uh, to fight this information um, through the Edmo project. Um, there was uh, one of the eight uh, hubs was uh, covering the, um, the Iberian region, so Spain and Portugal. And the activities will run for 30 months. We started on September with the kickoff uh, meeting. And they will go in, in six different lines. Uh, well, actually five, because the sixth one is just the management of the project. Um, of the five actions, some of them focus on um, detecting trends or new trends of fact checking, um, also um, making a map of the digital um, media in the, in the Spanish and Portugal landscape. But one of the five actions is specifically addressing media literacy um, actions. So we're, um, we're um, envisioning um, projects to um, target possible vulnerable audiences during these 30 months. Um, and apply everything that we've learned in our research to, to try and make them more, um, more critical and, and also um, uh, more uh, wiser consumers of, of the media. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm learning a lot uh, from, from media literacy because uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner. I've been working as a journalist for two decades and um, I'm, I'm aware, I, will, <laughs> I always remember this is an anecdote of when I started working um, on a television channel. Um, uh, I was just over the moon because I was 20 years old and I, was, I, I had been watching these guys for, for a long time and now I was one of them, only for a summer, but I was one of them. And the first uh, welcome quote that I received from one of the veterans was, if people knew how we made the news, they would never turn their TVs on again. And that was very shocking uh, to me. But then I learned why he said that. And I thought he had a very pessimistic view. Um, but it is true that people don't always know how the news are made. And if we widen the scope to uh, less professional media or media that may have different intentions than informing the people, um, it would be really wise to um, give them some dose of reality and uh, to know where the distortions can come from. So, um, as I said, I, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for the media literacy actions. I'm also um, thinking that um, in terms of um, solving the problem, I mean, I, I, I doubt that this is a problem that can be fully solved, uh, but we need more than just the uh, um, literacy actions and uh, media literacy actions to make up for the wrongs that certain audiences um, have. We need probably to go to the early stages uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the education system. Um, and this requires obviously political involvement to um, include media literacy uh, from very early stages and, and the collaboration of these uh, many actors that are involved here. So thank you thank for your you, time. I hope thank, thank you. Roberto for giving us an overview of your, your current and future activities and um, actually understanding. I, I think that a lot of issues has a reason and uh, there are some similarities across the countries. Now I would like to move to our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Sweet. She's a professor of comparative linguistics and communication and media studies and a member of uh, UNESCO Mill Alliance. Uh, and she, she's a professor at uh, Moulay Ismail University of Meknes in Morocco. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, moderator. Thank Make you for inviting me. I am pleased to be part of I'm pleased to be part of this uh, global roundtable on media, uh, on media literacy. Uh, I'm a fervent advocate of media information literacy for all, uh, targeting in particular general education 
uh, students with no prior knowledge of media and information. Uh, and my fields of uh, interest are uh, first news literacy and uh, information literacy in the digital age, linguistic literacy, and the role of language and communication in building peace and intercultural dialogue and media linguistics. Unfortunately, I will not talk about all these things today because I was invited to talk about the state of the art of media literacy in Morocco. And uh, this was uh, emphasized and highlighted in our pre-conference meeting yesterday. So my uh, intervention today will focus on media and information literacy in Morocco. Maybe in the uh, discussion, I can give more details uh, on uh, uh, news literacy and uh, my teachings and advocacy in this uh, regard. Uh, so uh, the uh, intervention will address media and information literacy. I have difficulties in talking only about media literacy because they are interconnected. Uh, so, uh, I would like to start first by giving two pre preliminaries. First, there is no national policy on media literacy in Morocco. Second, media literacy as a subject does not exist in the Moroccan curricula, although it is considered as an integral part of subjects dealing with media studies and cyber culture. So my paper will be divided into two parts, a brief part dealing with important educational reforms in the last two decades and an extended part dealing with landmarks in media information literacy efforts in Morocco in cooperation with UNESCO and the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. First, educational reforms. Morocco shifted to the modular degree program in 2003, which brought up uh, three major changes. Uh, the first one, for the first time, there was integration of a national common core module on communication for undergraduate studies in Moroccan universities and another common core module on computer skills. Uh, second, study skills and research methods were integrated in the curriculum, which provided opportunity to include information literacy in the units of the module. And third, making good use of the liberties awarded to universities to introduce new subjects. Moulay Ismail University, my university, was a pioneer a university in incorporating introduction to media studies in the curriculum of its general education and the graduate studies at the Department of English. In 2009, the emergency plan for higher education in Morocco made a breakthrough by generalizing media studies to all Moroccan universities and extending its time frame from one semester to two semesters to teach introduction to media studies and media and cyber culture. Many master's programs on media and communication were accredited by the Ministry of Education in various Moroccan universities. Since then, many conferences on various aspects of mass media were organized by various Moroccan universities. I would like to mention two landmark ones. In 2000 and, uh, 2010, Moulay Ismail University organized an international conference on media culture and society, uh, media culture and education, in which media literacy was a main theme addressed from multiple perspectives, including education, culture, religion, politics, wars, and technology. I was the coordinator of this important event, which was organized in partnership with the UNESCO chair forum University and Heritage and the Autonomous University of Barcelona. 
2011, Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University organized the first international forum on media information literacy in partnership with UNESCO as lead partner, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, ICESCO, the Arab Bureau of Education for the Gulf States and Wale Ismail University as key partners and a number of other partners. It was the first time, uh, it, the, the first global forum to tackle media and information literacy as a combined set of knowledge, competencies, and uh, attitudes with 40 uh, participating countries and over 200 participants from various parts of the world. The main outcomes of this international forum was first, the first declaration on media information literacy, the first declaration to combine both media literacy and information literacy. Second, the launch of the UNESCO United Nations Alliance of Civilizations University Network on Media Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue, of which both Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University and Mulay Ismail University are members. Third, the institutionalization of Global Meal Week to be celebrated in the last week of October every year. Since then, the leading two universities, Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University and Mule Ismail University have actively contributed to these annual celebrations. Four, launch of the first edition of the UNESCO MLI curriculum for teachers. Fifth, the first Arab consultations on the adaptation of the UNESCO MIL curriculum for teachers took place during the first international forum on uh, MIL. Morocco was represented in these consultations with high level delegations from both ministries of education and communication and information. Other Arab countries that participated in these consultations were Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. As a follow-up action to the Arab region consultation on MIL curriculum, a plan of action was consolidated to pilot the MIL curriculum in teacher training institutions in Morocco, Lebanon, and Oman. In uh, 2012, the Moroccan Ministry of Education produced a module on media and information literacy for integration in Moroccan curriculum of uh, curricula of teacher training institutions. Unfortunately, this excellent initiative has not yet, yet been implemented. 2013, as a representative of Moulay Ismail University to the UNESCO UNOC University Network, I have contributed to the UNESCO UNOC Clearing House on MIL, uh, an educational web website titled Media Information Literacy for All, which is hosted on the server of United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. In 2013-2014, Moulay Ismail University and Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University, these are the leading Moroccan universities in MIL. Uh, they contributed to the first and second editions of the UNESCO publication title, Overview of Information Literacy Resources Worldwide, by contributing two chapters on MIL resources in Arabic and the resources in French, for countries in North Africa. The UNESCO office in Rabat cooperated in the publication of a substantial number of awareness raising mill material in French addressed to journalists, broadcasters, civil society, and the general public. In 2014, Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University in partnership with Mula Ismail University and the sponsorship of UNOC organized in Arabic two training workshops for future and current education educators and a study day on information literacy in the digital age in the framework of the students exchange program of the Mili network. The results of the two training workshops in Morocco, as well as two other training workshops held 
uh, also uh, sponsored by uh, UNOP, held in Egypt, were published in the Milid Yearbook 2016, titled Opportunities for Media Information Literacy in the Middle East and North Africa, edited by Magda Abu Fadil, Jordi Torrent, and Alton Grizzle. Contributions from other countries in the MENA region were also included in this publication, which is considered a reference book of the state of the art of mill in the MENA region. This book was translated into Arabic to make it accessible to the large audiences in the Arab world. 2019, Mulay Ismail University and Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University were involved in the process of revision of the UNESCO Mill Curriculum for Teachers. Dr. Abdul Hamid Nfisi and I participated in the second international consultative meeting on the Mill Curriculum for Teachers, which took place in uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. The recommendations of this consultative Professor meeting- Professor Sweet, uh, I would like to ask you to conclude because we yes, run over yes. time actually, if you can, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, both uh, universities participated in the UNESCO Mill Network's response to COVID-19. Uh, last but not least, in celebration of the 10th anniversary of FES Declaration and uh, Global Week 2021, Mule Ismail University is organizing in partnership with UNESCO and a dozen of other partners, including the, uh, the Thessaloniki University and uh, uh, your uh, network, uh, 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 the, the, the international experts Please, conference. Uh, media and uh, audience media and information literacy, which will take place uh, on November 2030 uh, this year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sweet. And now let's move to our next speaker, Diana. Uh, yes, we're moving a bit faster because we're running out of time. Uh, we are. I'm now inviting Irene Andriopoulou. Uh, media literacy researcher, policy analyst, um, practitioner and advocate on media for nearly 20 years. And she, uh, just to sum up her, uh, her very impressive uh, resume, she is a now selected member of the new European expert group on tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy through education and training, and has also been serving as a member of the EC Media Literacy Expert Group. She works closely with UNESCO as Global Co-Secretary General of the International Steering Committee. So Irene, the floor is yours. Everyone, thank you for the introduction and the invitation uh, to this uh, uh, webinar today. Today and the whole week is a uh, full uh, MIL uh, due to UNESCO Global uh, Mill Week. Uh, I would like to uh, to mention the head of the uh, recent uh, EU expert group on tackling disinformation and promoting uh, digital literacy through education and training. The goal is uh, to have a final report and some guidelines for uh, teachers and educators in September 22 uh, uh, in a European uh, context. Uh, so uh, one of the, um, my main hat is uh, as a co-secretary general of the International Steering Committee of UNESCO Mill Alliance. Um, uh, Sherry also mentioned that uh, because uh, as uh, uh, vice chair, we work closely together. So this is a network that supports, coordinates, advises, and, and um, promotes media information literacy in cooperation with uh, uh, Mother UNESCO. It is a multitask group and uh, you are I, I won't elaborate more you can go to their website and read all about the actions uh, uh, this group is doing uh, I would just like to mention the recent uh, booklet about the members of the International Steering Committee it is a who is who booklet so if you want to get to know uh, us better uh, uh, you can get in touch and read about uh, uh, about it in this uh, booklet so the state of art uh, in uh, Greece, uh, media literacy in Greece, it is also approached as an umbrella concept. During the pandemic, it became a trendy topic. 
and uh, it is approached uh, uh, through uh, national uh, media literacy export, uh, actors, such as the National uh, Center of Audiovisual Media and Communication, ECOME. Uh, it is also approached as an academic field of study over 20 years now. So I would like to mention that uh, uh, Europe started to, 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 to study media information literacy as a, a school of thought, a theoretical school of thought. And now I see that uh, Europe, uh, from the examples that Sheree presented, has a more practical approach. So that is interesting to, to mention. It is also approached uh, uh, through the creative industry. We have many kids film festival that produce educational resources on film and media literacy. Uh, it is present in uh, the Ministry of Education, not as an uh, as an autonomous uh, autonomous media studies uh, object of study, but cross curricularly uh, 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 and cross thematically. And uh, there are a lot of actions from the civil society, a grassroots approach to bottom up, and also the private sector with many uh, media educational companies that uh, are working uh, uh, also with Erasmus and European projects. So uh, this is about, uh, yes, media literacy in typical education. Um, there, there was a, a public discourse all, throughout all these years. The most recent development that it's worth mentioning is this uh, new platform, 21 Skills Labs, that have four thematic circles. They are addressed from preschool education to uh, high school education, uh, and they are compulsory from this year, 2021 to 22, 2022. And um, according to these four thematic circles, in one of these circles, we meet uh, media literacy under ICT skills, but it is clearly mentioned that media literacy is one of uh, the themes that uh, educators can work on. Uh, this, whole, this whole situation uh, falls into the flipped classroom uh, hybrid model that emerged during the pandemic uh, with the uh, authority of media resources and with the students having uh, the leading role. Uh, I will just go quickly. And uh, then I would like to mention the work that is done by ECOME, the National Center of uh, um, uh, Media Com and Communication, because uh, we collaborated with UNESCO in 2018 and uh, that year we also produced the white paper on media and information literacy. It is under our third pillar, Educate, and uh, we uh, are uh, closely uh, related to UNESCO MIL approach, uh, but also have uh, the three, uh, 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 three tiers approach, basic skills, uh, that are the technical skills, advanced skills, cognitive skills, and vocational skills that address uh, uh, the training of uh, media professionals. These are some of uh, uh, the actions that, and projects that we run at ECOME. We also partnered with uh, UNESCO on the Greek uh, production edition, edition of uh, the Milk Clicks Pact, Think Critically and Click Wisely. Uh, we're also uh, um, national uh, partners of the Do Media Test. This is a new project uh, produced within Creative uh, Europe Media Literacy for All that has to do with the assessment and training uh, tool within typical education for secondary uh, educational uh, students. And it's going to be available uh, in, in 10 languages in the European uh, Union and uh, freely available for assessment and education educational uh, tools. These are some of uh, the organizations that uh, we are uh, partners. There are uh, European organizations like EAVI and SOMA. Um, we also uh, work with the European Media Literacy Week, apart from the Greek Media Literacy Week and the UNESCO. And uh, we also work uh, closely with the Council of Europe on studies and research. And um, a close, um, a project that is worth mentioning is uh, the one we're doing with UNESCO Mill Alliance. This is the Mediterranean group. And uh, it the aim is to promote the scopes of the Alliance and coordinate the mill actions and policies in the Mediterranean region for a broader momentum in the area. We have this far 50 members from 11 Mediterranean countries and one transnational member. 
and uh, uh, we're working uh, based on five task forces. Uh, you can see the task force down there, promotion, research, synergies, creative industry, and MIL in schools. And uh, last year we issued, uh, these are, uh, this is a map of uh, the members of the Mediterranean group. Some of the members, they come from regula regulation, from uh, academia field, uh, from uh, typical education, from governmental bodies. And the, uh, last year we launched the mini webinar series uh, that uh, um, it was a response, part of the global response uh, uh, towards the pandemic and uh, the disinformation and the, the abundance of uh, in, uh, information on the other hand. So these are the thematics of uh, the four webinars uh, we launched last year. Uh, we had attendance from 41 countries uh, globally. Um, the first webinar was on policies and practices. So these are some of the key outcomes that uh, uh, um, uh, all the, 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 the guest speakers uh, we all uh, come out uh, with. The most important is that there is a need for a common code of action in the Mediterranean. Uh, on media information literacy. The second one was on disinformation. We had also Professor Panagiotou among uh, the guest speakers, and it was one of the most successful webinar. Uh, it had the, the, the most attendance uh, from the participants. And these are some of the key outcomes and, uh, and some challenges uh, that uh, uh, were the, 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 the result of this uh, webinar. The third webinar was more technically oriented, had to do with the digital skills and uh, the lack of uh, digital parenting was one uh, of the main challenges that emerged. Parents still need more guidance, more resources on how to deal with uh, media and their uh, excessive use of media of, of their children. The second webinar had to, uh, was focused uh, on Greece and the creative industry and the Kids Film Festival and all the uh, initiatives and projects that take place and address uh, typical education. Uh, it had a strong link with the uh, film cities, UNESCO film cities and UNESCO MIL cities. Um, the upper goal was uh, in, in the film education, how to create a screen wise viewer. And there is a lot of resources and educational material in this uh, aspect of MIL too. Uh, so stay tuned. This was uh, the CERC one and uh, we'll have a second uh, circle coming in the next year. And uh, this is just my main uh, quote to close this uh, uh, discussion today, that uh, um, post-pandemic wise, now it's a time to rethink critically and act practically through this hybrid economy digital knowledge model and uh, uh, media information literacy. And through my engagement in the past 20 years, the point this challenge has always been reaching uh, a media information literacy consensus for all aspects of our digital oriented life. We're getting there faster and better than ever. And we have to thank UNESCO over 40 years in full work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene, for the insightful presentation, uh, Aura. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, that was really interesting. And I feel like we, we're sort of starting to see a, a trend um, in the approach towards media and information literacy, um, and generally really, really blown away by the kind of work that everybody is doing. Um, so our next speaker coming from Zimbabwe is Farai Mwakutuya, who is an international journalist who's worked with CGTN. He is also one of the um, founding members of the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Association um, and uh, has such an incredible <laughs> plethora of uh, accomplishments that he's done. So I'm gonna hand it over to Farai. Farai, you'll be um, able to share a little bit more about the work that you do and also your thoughts um, and observations of media and information literacy on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aura. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Um, uh, thank you so much for this invitation and being part of this panel. I'm not, um, it's a very esteemed panel. Unfortunately, my credentials are not as great as the previous speakers, but it's still very wonderful to be rubbing shoulders and, and, and being here. Um, I think my insights are, I'll be very quickly talk about the experience that I've had where I've worked in East Africa and here in Zimbabwe. 
uh, for many, many years. Um, I just want to very quickly talk about the challenge, well, my observations and also the challenges that I see. I think in terms of media literacy, we, we certainly have a big challenge in Africa in general, but also specifically zoning into Zimbabwe. And I think um, it's a point that's just been raised by the previous speaker where they talked about skills. So the digital skills, especially as, as media becomes more digital, we assume that you know everybody will be able to find their way and learn as they go along as we did, uh, how to use and navigate the internet and all those things. So I think it's great now that there is a deliberate effort to try and teach that because I think digital skills are lacking and we take it for, you know, for granted that people do have those skills. Those skills and the access to digital media is also very restricted to urban centers, to the affluent, whereas we know that the bulk of the, 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 bulk, the bulk of the population in Africa are rural based. So in terms of access, there is a big problem there. I think there is also a challenge in terms of the diversity uh, of media that is available. Uh, in many countries, you'll see that it is a state-owned media and uh, very few private-owned media. And so in terms of the available information, the type of information that can be accessed uh, and, and um, you know, consumed is very limited in that respect. Um, I also want to talk about the fact that, um, you know, literacy is very low. And, and uh, I just want to highlight two examples. Um, here in, in, in Africa, and not just in Zimbabwe, but in many African countries I've gone to, uh, people believe that, um, you know, WhatsApp has become so powerful, has become so pervasive, whatever link, whatever website, whatever web content is posted on WhatsApp, people assume or take it as gospel truth, which is a big challenge. And I observe that every single day where, you know, people who are very well educated uh, uh, will ask you something that they've seen on WhatsApp, which is clearly fake um, and, and think that that is true. So that speaks to the fact that people um, across the divide do not verify, do not think critically, do not question. And I think that is something that we, we certainly need to address. Uh, there is also, uh, in addition to that issue, an example, again, I want to use, I'm uh, much later in life pursuing a lifelong dream I had of studying law. And I've just enrolled at the local university and I'm uh, coming face to face with school leavers who are very fresh and green out of high school. And again, you know, we've been working in the initial weeks on just accessing information, where to get information, how to uh, sift through that information and to find out just how accurate, authentic it is. And again, I see a lot of, uh, you know, naivety, a lot of uh, a lack of awareness there. So uh, we clearly have a problem here where I think uh, we need to address it at a very structural level, which is what I think is being proposed here, um, to take it uh, to a level where we are teaching it as part of our curriculum. The Zimbabwe education curriculum has just recently been revamped. Uh, and I think a lot of the focus, a lot of the attention has been on making it more practical, on making it more vocational, so not just teaching theory. But I think having been part of this panel now and listening to the insights, I think there is also a role there. And I think we need to look at media literacy being part of the curriculum and being taught at a very young age. Critical thinking has been you know, observed as being one of the most important skills that will be required going forward. And, and if we are able to teach children at a very young age to be critical, to question, to look for other sources of information and not just rely on the state media. You know, um, people see the news, people hear uh, government ministers or government officials say things and assume that that is correct. So we need to teach critical thinking. We need to teach media literacy because obviously that is crucial for development. Access to information, access to uh, accurate information uh, obviously influences outcomes in terms of development, in terms of uh, getting people to be aware. Uh, and so I think in that respect, it is very, very important. So my observations and, and, uh, are that, um, you know, we need to look at that. We, we have a, a, a gap in terms of media literacy. I also want to talk as a media practitioner, something very close to my own heart is that another observation I've made is that the media itself, some of these people who are uh, peddling what ends up being false or inaccurate information are actually themselves not aware and are also suffering from a lack of media literacy. So you see a lot of journalists who will see things that they've seen on uh, you know, obscure websites, websites that are clearly not authentic uh, and report that as if it's true. And because of the role that media has, the, the influence that it has, they end up uh, you know, 
are perpetuating some of this disinformation. So I also feel there is a responsibility and a need within the media profession itself for professional training, for teaching these critical skills. Uh, but I think, you know, what has been very encouraging in, the, in this uh, discussion that I've been in is that uh, we need to take it as far down as children when they are young, because they're obviously consuming it a lot earlier than we were. And it is important that we, we instill in them the need for this digital literacy, media literacy, and, and critical thinking. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my observation. That's my experience. And I'm happy to share and discuss and ask more questions as we go along. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us a very important perspective from Africa, that uh, especially from Zimbabwe as well, that uh, together with uh, Kenya, to the extent of my knowledge, have implemented a lot of very interesting uh, media literacy initiatives. I would like now to pass the floor to Aren Melikan. Aren uh, is uh, an expert and also a, uh, an educator regarding media literacy issues, but uh, with a special focus on conflict analysis and resolution. Aaron, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, honestly, I wouldn't call myself an, an expert because I'm a journalist and I see myself more as a journalist. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about the media, media literacy in Armenia in a more journalistic perspective just to sum up and to share with you how is the situation there. Basically, we are in a situation where uh, the media is talking about the fake news and um, how bad the situation, the circumstances for the media literacy are, but the media itself doesn't teach people how to be media literate. So they are talking about the fake news, but they are not teaching how to check the information that you get. Um, Media, the term media literacy is not that much circulated in Armenia uh, like uh, for a long time. It has been around approximately from 2011 or 2012 when a local organization has started to, with their own initiative, uh, started to develop uh, media literacy in the country, mainly with the support of inter international organizations uh, because unfortunately, the Armenian state itself uh, doesn't pay much uh, much attention uh, to the media literacy. So basically, whatever is done done by uh, personal in initiatives and uh, local NGOs. For example, we have um, media initiative center and a couple of more organizations. One of them was mentioned earlier um, that do really uh, important work regarding uh, spreading the word and teaching. Uh, people at their uh, at any age how to consume the information. The start uh, the state has started to think about implementing uh, media literacy as a subject in schools in a school curriculum approximately two years ago after uh, um, the Velvet Revolution in the country when um, younger generation came to the power. Uh, so they started to think what they can do about that, but unfortunately. Um, uh, the war, uh, the recent war between Armenia and Azerbaijan last year, and we cut off the uh, topic. So it's not on the table um, as, as active as it was previously. However, it's going to be a part of the subject called sociology. And I've had and I've had a chance to talk to a couple of uh, teachers who teach sociology sociology at schools in Armenia, uh, particularly in remote regions, and uh, they admit that they lack media literacy themselves. So how are they going to solve the problem of teaching kids media literacy? That's yet another problem. I was uh, working for one of um, uh, local uh, NGOs um, kind of focused on developing media literacy in the country Union of, Union of Informed Citizens uh, back in 2019 when they did um, a research. And we found out, um, we were trying to find out how the situation with the media literacy is in the country. And what we found out that um, there is a huge difference between the levels of media literacy in the capital city, Yerevan, and in the regions of the country. And also uh, it, uh, the, the difference between the levels were differing uh, depending on 
the money they earn, uh, of course, on the education, I'm not even talking about that, but also about uh, on the regions and how do they far live from the cities. This is the problem. People who are living uh, out of uh, kind of the capital city and the main cities, and Armenia is, uh, if uh, some of you do not know, it's a country of 3 million in the South Caucasus, and two thirds of the country lives um, out of the capital city. So basically these, these people suffer uh, with a pretty low uh, level of media literacy. Uh, what, we, uh, what we can do is uh, going to schools and teach. Yeah, uh, fortunately the organizations I mentioned, they have their own kind of grants. They are giving small grants to teachers. They are teaching, to, uh, they are teaching the teachers from the schools media literacy and they are also um, giving some kind of grants to the teachers so they can teach the media literacy. Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to check whether uh, everything is fine with my connection because I'm not sure. No, it is okay. It is okay, Anna. Yeah, okay. great. Uh, I'm sorry because as I mentioned earlier, I'm having some thousand people's demonstration in the neighborhood and I hope uh, it doesn't uh, damage my internet. Uh, yeah, and we also found out that um, people are still uh, not aware how to consume the media. Uh, Armenia is a post-Soviet country and a lot of people are still seeing the media as they used to see the media in the Soviet Union. I'm talking especially about the elder generation. And fortunately, another like a very good, um, I'm not, well, uh, another, uh, another thing we found out, the media literacy level was very uh, high in comparison for people from 18 to 35 years old. And to those are the people who have been kind of a, a part of these programs, trainings that have been uh, done uh, with the support of the international organization and uh, kind of embassies of different countries uh, in Yerevan. Uh, Basically, I believe this uh, this has some kind of result, and eventually this uh, resulted in um, two big uh, crisis situations um, for the media itself, um, and um, I, I just a very good a good example. Uh, a friend of mine sent me um, a screenshot of a post before I was joining this meeting. Uh, it was a post of uh, a post from Facebook and it was saying, it was a woman writing that um, the man who is getting vaccinated uh, will forever lose his charm for her. Uh, this is a very good example how um, kind of getting vaccinated can be unpopular in Armenia right now. Just another effect of uh, being affected by the fake news and uh, being not capable of consuming media properly. Uh, eventually, uh, we end up with 15 uh, percent, 15, I'm repeating, 15 percent of people getting vaccinated with only their first dose. And uh, we kind of faced a, a bigger crisis uh, during, as I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the previous war between Armenia and Azerbaijan a year ago on these days because people found themselves in a crisis situation and they weren't uh, ever taught how to behave in the media in a crisis situation, how to consume the media and uh, what's the psychology of the media in a crisis situation. But there is a good news too. I'm not. Uh, I don't want to be very uh, pessimistic about the situation because, as I told, there is some improvement. Obviously, the kids, uh, the young people, who are getting the opportunity and the regions, and there are a lot of programs for them. Um, even if those are not supported by the state, by but supported by NGOs or uh, kind of other organizations, the young people are really interested in learning how the media works, and they are really excited about getting this knowledge, getting this information. So hopefully um, this all excitement can be used for their, um, to put all this effort in their school's curriculums too. That's it, thank you very much. Aaron, thank you very much. And I would like to thank you all for uh, your uh, excellent presentations.
I would like to ask Ellie if she wants briefly to give like a show, a very short description of your program, Ellie, because Ellie has been part of this and I know very well the program that I think that it could be, it should be actually shared with everyone. Ellie, please, if you can. I caught uh, you surprise, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can give a very brief de description. Thank you, Nikos. That's a really kind invitation. Um, so I run a program called Newswise um, in the UK, which is um, a partnership between the Guardian Foundation, the National Literacy Trust and the PSHE Association. So we bring together expertise in journalism and in literacy and in PSHE, which is personal, social health and economic education um, so a bit like citizenship but we work specifically with primary schools so the 7 to 11 age group which is quite unusual because a lot of media literacy programs especially in the UK are more focused on older children so what we do is try and get in at the earliest age so I was really interested in what Sherry was saying about working with even younger children at, at preschool age even um, and yeah lots and lots of the things that everyone's been talking about this afternoon have really resonated it's definitely all about critical thinking so we're introducing those critical questioning skills um, but it's also about um, understanding how the uh, media is produced we're specifically about news literacy uh, so Jesse I'd really love to hear more about what you do with news literacy um, so yeah how how is the news made um, where does it come from and why it's important so understanding that um, in the first place then putting those critical skills to analyze news texts and media texts and information. So questioning, where's it come from? Do I trust it? But also, um, is it biased? Is it misleading? How are people represented? Um, and then putting that together by actually producing their own news reports as well. So um, by understanding how news is made and where it comes from, understanding what it should be, that it should be truthful and fair and balanced then making their own news reports. So uh, learning by doing in that respect as well. So having active participation um, in news production too. So that's what we do. Um, we work directly with schools um, in the UK, um, but all our resources are also available online for educators everywhere to download and use. So that's a, a brief summary of what we do. And our, our um, evaluation is all available and transparent and you can, can read about um, the impact that it has. I should mention, we also do teach training. And so lots of the things you've been mentioning about educators not having the confidence, that's really come out recently. The, um, the UK government department for digital media and culture just very belatedly um, published their um, online media literacy strategy. Um, and one of the things that came out of that is the fact that educators lack confidence in this. Um, and one of the things that we do is a lot of teacher training to try and build those skills um, with, with teachers so that they feel more confident in, in addressing these issues with their students. Um, and yeah, we have really positive results. Go and have a look at our evaluation. And if you want to learn in more detail what we do, I'm running a session tomorrow, actually. So you can join that um, as part of Global Mill Week. So sorry, sneaky plug for something. No, that's no, happening no. Tomorrow. <laughs> No, no, Ellie. Thank you very much for being short and on time. I would like to start from uh, the last question uh, from Michael. Uh, it is addressed to Aaron. Is the media freedom, freedom, I'm sorry, increasing under the last few years or worse? And then I will pass the floor to my co-moderators, to Diana and uh, Aura to ask questions. Uh, Aaron, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's a very controversial, uh, the answer is very controversial because uh, somehow there is a kind of a huge uh, free, uh, freedom when it comes uh, to the social media and the media itself. So uh, yeah, the, as a journalist, I mean, I've, uh, I haven't been kind of seeing any limitation or something hindering my uh, professional work or uh, stopping me for, from something. But um, I also have feeling that somehow um, it is decreasing. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the freedom of the media uh, because of a very recent uh, kind of amendment, which is, for example, uh, forbidding um, slurring uh, if it's addressed to an authority. 
and uh, eventually some people are really kind of uh, bothered with this and because it's it limits their this is a very kind of something we can debate a lot about uh, and uh, not to be sure who is right and who is wrong here, but um, anyway, I think that uh, when, uh, still there is a big freedom, a huge freedom, uh, but there are some things that can limit that, that came up very recently. So hopefully uh, they won't. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Diana, Aura, please. I would just uh, like to add a question to Sherry. And uh, we are always talking about the, the adults after a certain age. You cannot teach them uh, in the same with the same easiness uh, as you do with uh, the younger generation. How do you feel that you have done a podcast for, for kids? How do you feel? Is it easier with the, the newer generations? Is it not? How, how do you feel it from one year to another? An interesting question. I think that th what's easier is that they have less preconceived ideas the younger you get to them. So you're a little more of a clean slate the younger that you can talk to folks. But young, you know, there's a you're not you're not having the same critical thinking conversation with a three-year-old that you are with an eight-year-old, that you are with a 15-year-old. So you're shaping the conversation to what to the way they are interacting with media and what um, what is age appropriate in terms of what their cognitive abilities are. So I, I would never want to say that it's too late because I think if somebody's 85 and I can sit down with them and talk to them about media re reflecting and critical thinking, that's still really important. So I, I don't think it matters what age. What I think is important is that as media literacy educators, that we are willing to meet them where they are and to, to shift the way we, whether it's curriculum or activities or just an appreciation of the fun of media so that you can begin from that place and then have a conversation. I think that's what's most important, really. Thank you. Aura. Thank you. Um, so I have a question here for Farai. Um, just make sure I have the right one. Okay, this is coming from Asimina, and uh, she's asking um, if you have a comment on how migrants from Africa use social media to communicate with facilitators that promise to help them to reach the uh, European Union. Yeah, I think obviously that that is a, a huge, huge problem, and um, I think it's not just about. I mean. I remember about three, four years ago, I, I did a story about uh, a girl who had been uh, promised a great job in Iran and then she went there and then she ended up, ended up being abused and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, and she had gotten all these contacts via, via certain websites. So I think, you know, that is, is the, uh, speaks to the real challenge where people see a, a promise of, of a fantastic life or better prospects and then simply take it on, on, on uh, on, on the merits or on face value. Uh, I think there's obviously very uh, an important need to educate people about that, about the dangers of social media, that you know it can be abused, it is abused, uh, that not everything you see, that you should verify indeed that uh, this is really happening. So if you're promised a job, uh, try and see if the said company actually exists. Uh, try to find out if, if any other people have had, you know, other experiences that actually traveled there, uh, go through the news and see, you know, uh, these sort of scandals are there. So I think it just speaks to the fact that people see social media and don't question it at all. Uh, don't bother to think that you know, what's being said there may not necessarily be true. Uh, and I think it obviously speaks to, to uh, highlight the need for, for this sort of uh, education. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I think that uh, I will open up the floor in case that there is any other question. Okay, I would like to thank you all, and I would like to thank my co-moderators. We didn't receive any positive comment on the chat room, but I will ignore that and will bypass that. Um, and um, I would like to, to endorse also Faral because there's an endorsement that Aura didn't mention about uh, from uh, 
Prosica Walla, as you, um, that she endorsed about the situation of uh, MIL in most African countries. I think it is a very important initiative and, we, and it was very interesting that we had the opportunity to have all this global outlook, uh, an outlook of AUKUS countries, Australia, US and UK, and also from uh, Greece, uh, Spain, um, Armenia, um, and also from uh, Morocco and uh, North Africa. And But most importantly, I would like to thank everyone for being part of this event, which is part of our uh, webinars that we initiated on March 2020 with the support of um, U.S. Department, State Department Citizens and Exchanges Office and World Learning, whom we would like to thank for their support. And I would also like to thank my co-moderators, the speakers for being so kind, and also you that uh, have been part of this very interesting group. Looking forward to have you again and uh, see you in person since we are back and um, or try to be back in normality. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.